All right, so here we are. We got a great show for you today. We have on here Lewis Essig, and Lewis was formerly incarcerated, and that's how I know him. We've been in the, I guess you could say we've been in the same field before. I'm just going to let Lewis tell a little bit of a story. So without further ado, here we go. Yeah, thanks for having me on, man. Um, you know, I, uh, I just to give you a little background uh, where I grew up, how I grew up. I grew up in a little small town called Grandview Heights, um, suburban neighborhood, um, you know, fairly well off, didn't really uh, want or need for much growing up. So my story doesn't involve, you know, um, the electric electricity getting shut off or hand me down clothes or, uh, you know, being hungry. I don't really have um, any of that as a kid. Uh, growing up, you know, it was it was it was pretty normal. Christmases were normal. Holidays were good. I went to school, did well in school. I was really active um, from a young age. So I, I always did all the youth sports, baseball, football, soccer, um, all of that. Um, going into uh, to fifth grade. So I, I am an alcoholic addict. I'm in recovery. I've been sober for four years, eight months and some change. Uh, which is honestly a miracle. Uh, there was a point in my life where I couldn't go, you know, 24 hours. I couldn't string 24 hours together. Um, so to, to put together that time and, and to have the life I have today, you know, I'm, I'm truly grateful for that. Uh, the, first, um, the first experience I had with, with any kind of information that was given to me about drugs and alcohol was the D.A.R.E. program. I don't know if you remember D.A.R.E. Yeah. Uh, so it was the whole, like, just say no campaign. And, um, you know, I always, I always share and tell people that, that, that worked for me for a while. Um, it instilled fear in me. And when I was in fifth grade, I was a young kid and, you know, that fear, uh, carried me to, you know, about freshman year of high school. And basically what I, what I had learned from that was if I use drugs, it's going to ruin my life. And that was all I needed, uh, at the time. Now, that being said, you you fast forward to freshman year of high school and you start to see some of your buddies that you've grown up with. And that's the thing about Grandview where I grew up is most of these kids, you are with them K through 12. So you you grow up with these kids. You know, it's not a real big school, um, 400 kids in the high school. So, you know, everybody. And so, you, you know, you watch some of your buddies that you grew up with going out, having a beer, um, smoking some weed and they come back to school on Monday and their lives aren't ruined, right? There's no, there's no immediate consequence. Right. Um, they're still going to class. And in fact, it looks like they had a lot of fun. So eventually uh, I would cave to that. Uh, and it, it, you know, a lot of people talk about peer pressure. I think that was part of it, but I think, you know, being young and wanting to fit in was kind of the biggest, biggest piece there was, uh, you know, you get to high school and you just want to fit in. It's, it's as easy as that. And it felt like a, a fast track to fitting in. So I went to a party and uh, smoked some weed and had a couple beers. And, and I'll tell you, um, man, it felt like the world kind of opened up to me. Um, I could talk to girls. I went back to school on Monday and everyone was like, oh, man, Lewis, that party was great. You know, and, and, and this, this, was a big, this was a big moment for me. You know, but I still had that that dare piece in the back of my head where I didn't want to overdo it because if I overdid it, then I'd ruin my life. Um, that being said, uh, when it comes to genes and alcoholism, uh, it runs in my family. So, you know, I was predisposed to alcoholism. That's the way I see it. And progressively moving through high school, um, you know, I would... Uh, eventually start smoking weed, you know, maybe it was, it started out every month and now it's every other week and, you know, just on the weekends, but now maybe once during the week and it progressively got worse. And then by junior year, you know, I get introduced to pills, Adderall, you know, and, oh, wow, this is great. Now I, now I can study better. Now I, now I can take tests better. Um, and all the meanwhile, I'm still getting good grades. I'm still, uh, I played golf. I was excelling at golf. I was, I was very good at it, played on the varsity team. Uh, so again, no consequences. By senior year, 
I was smoking pot daily. We had open lunch at Grandview. So I don't know if you don't know what open lunch is. It means we can leave the school for an hour, <laughs> go wherever we want for lunch. And when you do what I did, that meant we can go to my buddy's house and smoke and or drink and then come back to school. Right. So, and again, it's, it's a neighborhood where we're well off. So most of our parents are giving us, you know, back in 2008, you know, five bucks a day for lunch. Mm -hmm. And so by the time Friday rolls around, you got 25 bucks, you got four buddies, you got 25 bucks. That's a hundred bucks. Right. And you're good to go for the weekend. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, I'm partying hard. Uh, you can barely fit my, my head through a door because of my ego. Um, 18, I'm bulletproof. I'm, I'm getting high. Uh, got a girlfriend. You know, my grades are good. I actually picked where I wanted to go to college based off of uh, how big of a party school it was. So I chose OU, Ohio University. <laughs> Uh, so that was my sole reasoning. There was nothing else other than I think I can get in there because of my grades. And I hear they throw a great Halloween party. So uh, I applied and got in. And, um, you know, up to that point in my life, there were no consequences. There was like one time where the cops busted a party, but nothing happened. I just, I like, they were like, just go home. I was like, okay, cool. Um, so yeah, man, like from the outside looking in, I was just like a regular high school kid getting ready to go to college. Things changed for me uh, between my senior year of high school and my freshman year of college. I was introduced to Oxycontin. And so at this time, you know, I was well versed in uh, people, places and things when it came to drugs. And what I mean by that is I dabbled in, uh, you know, I was a bit of a salesman. You know, I wanted to make some extra cash. So my drugs were cheaper. Um, and due to that fact, when I would find myself around certain people buying certain things, I was often introduced to other things. And so that's where Oxycontin came in. And back in 2009, Oxycontin was very popular and it was very cheap. And uh, basically I went to get some weed and, and my buddy was like, hey man, you ever done these? And I was like, no. And he's like, oh, well here, take these, uh, sell them, do them, whatever. And uh, I tried one and I fell in love with it. It's hard not to. Right. Uh, opiates are highly addictive and make you feel really, really good. Mm -hmm. And uh, I picked up an Oxycontin habit almost immediately um, because I had no consequences doing anything else. I didn't think it was any different. So off to college I go and uh, I get, get down to OU and that, that all of a sudden Lewis isn't a very big man anymore. He's not a big deal anymore. And that was really hard for me because in the town I grew up in, I was a big deal, you know, and, and people needed me. Uh, and that went away when I got down to OU and it was really uncomfortable for me. So I always found myself the first semester I came back every single weekend. I did not stay down at OU, not one single weekend. My girlfriend would come get me. I'd come back to Columbus, um, get what I needed and go back to school. Uh, again, still, still using pills daily. Uh, I would drop out of OU after two semesters and come back to Columbus and I, I got a job at uh, Five Guys Burgers and Fries and kind of had my little side business and thought that was a better alternative to, uh, to college. Um, and, you know, at the time it, it seemed like it was, you know, I had a, a nice condo. Um, we both had a car. Was, wasn't really making my money at Five Guys. It was just kind of something I felt like I needed to do was work a job. And um, around 2011, uh, Purdue Pharmaceuticals would change the formula to their Oxycontin to make it so that uh, you couldn't abuse them as easily. And when that happened, the whole pill market, it got destroyed. It got blown up. And uh, that's when heroin became really popular. And that's also when I found out that I was severely dependent upon opiates. Um, when the whole pill market got flipped upside down, the prices went way up, um, demand was way up and the supply just disappeared. And, um, you know, I was, I would be at work one night severely sick. And if you're familiar with opiate withdrawal, that's, it's horrible. It's a horrible feeling. Um, sweats, 
you know, cold sweats, muscle spasms, you're throwing up in some cases. Uh, and basically one of my coworkers was like, Hey man, like I can get you some heroin. And when you're in that state where you're that sick and you just want to feel better as crazy as it sounds. And as many times as I told myself growing up, I would never touch a drug like that. I, I, I did, I chose to. And, um, then my life really started to spiral down the toilet bowl. So I'd start using heroin. I'd get kicked out of my, uh, apartment broke up with my girlfriend lost my job at five guys um couldn't keep a job at a burger place for christ's sake and um would move back home with my parents um essentially i was unemployable i couldn't keep a dollar in my pocket i had no friends Uh, my family you know really didn't want anything to do with me but put up with me just so i wasn't homeless and um you know, eventually a friend of mine would come to me and say, hey, man, you should come to this 12 step meeting with me. Uh, 12 step meetings are places where people in recovery go. And I went to this meeting and I heard this guy tell a story similar to what I'm doing today. And, you know, he'd tell his story and I, uh, I was able to identify with a lot of it. But there was one piece of it I didn't identify with. And he, t- he mentioned legal trouble. And I remembered going up to him after the meeting and saying, hey, man, uh, that was a really good story, but I haven't been in legal trouble yet, and I don't think that I'm going to get in legal trouble. <laughs> and uh, he, was, he was like, oh, it'll come. He's like, it, it'll come. Keep doing what you're doing. It'll happen. And, you know, I still, even through all the misery that I had been through, thought I was smarter than everybody else. So... I thought I was going to be able to navigate what I was doing without legal trouble. Well, come to find out he was exactly right. The legal issues did come. And um, I have found that when the legal issues start, it's kind of like a floodgate opening up. And it's very interesting how that happens. I've seen it a lot of times. I've seen it with a lot of people in my current job now. We'll get to that uh, shortly. And, and, just being in in and around people in recovery, it's like you get you get a charge and it doesn't stop. Um, and so eventually, you know, small town of men, the cops knew who I was. They'd pull me over. Um, I tried to run from them in the car. I don't really know why. I think I just kind of panicked. But I ended up driving like four blocks. Uh, and, and they arrested me for a misdemeanor eluding charge. And I got down to the county jail and I got in booking and I knew I was smart enough to know that it was a misdemeanor and it was my first charge. So I'm thinking OR. I'm thinking I'm going home tomorrow. So I'm kind of talking shit to the cop on the way down to county. Like, <laughs> yeah, man, I'm going home tomorrow. So whatever, dude, like do what you got to do. Uh, I'm getting out in the morning. Um, and we get down there and he books us in and he gets in my coat. He like pats me down one more time, gets in my coat and he pulled out a bag of, of heroin. Um, and that's instantly two felonies. That's instantly a felony conveyance charge and instantly a uh, felony possession charge. And my heart kind of just sunk to my stomach. And I realized that uh, this was serious you know, that my life essentially was going to be changed forever from that point forward. I ended up bonding out. They dismissed the felonies for future indictment and uh, back off to the races. Nothing changed. I didn't get clean. You know, it's not where my story ended. It wasn't like, oh, yeah, that happened. And the end, I got sober. No, I went straight back to it, man. Um, And it would go on like that for about a year or two where I was just kind of like in and out of jail, whether it was like three days, three weeks, a month, three weeks. I mean, dude, it was just nonstop revolving door of petty little misdemeanor charges. Uh, and then eventually I'd get an OVI and with that OVI came another couple of felonies. And, um, you know, I, uh, got put on probation for that OVI. And I remember I went to my first visit and I, I knew I was going to drop dirty for him. And, you know, you drop dirty one time and they violate you. 
And uh, at that point, we had left Grandview. I was still living with my parents. We had left Grandview and moved out to the west side of Columbus off of Haig Avenue, which didn't really help uh, help the matter. Um, drugs are obviously, you know, running rampant over there. Um, and eventually my dad would kick me out of the house and, and he, I think he looked at me and he said, he said, good luck, son. And, um, and I left and, uh, you know, from there I would, uh, I remember my first night being homeless and I tell this story a lot and it's, it, I tell it a lot because it was really impactful for me. And I, uh, I tell it because, you know, I mentioned the way I grew up, which was in a really nice suburban neighborhood. I got a good education. I went to college. I had everything I needed. And that first night I would get this sleeping bag from these nice church ladies uh, by the apartment where my parents were. There was a church back there. And so that's the first place I went and they gave me this sleeping bag. And I'd go to sleep in the woods that night. I found this wooded area and I remember waking up at like three in the morning and I didn't have any, I wasn't like in anything. I didn't have an umbrella. I didn't, and it was pouring down rain. And I remember like just pulling the sleeping bag over my head and just being like, how, you know, how did I get to this point? And I was strung out, you know, I, I was severely addicted to heroin. Um, really didn't care if I walked out in the middle of the street and got hit by a bus or if I went to prison at that point. Um, either of those sounded like good options. Um, and eventually those, those uh, future indictments would come back on those felonies uh, and warrants were put out for my arrest. I missed my court date and they came and got me and they found me walking down the street one day. I went to jail and, you know, unfortunately it wasn't the last time, but uh, it was the first time I asked for help from my public defender. It was a, I asked for a sentencing option, told me, Mr. Essig, if I put you on probation and you come back in front of me with a violation, I'm sending you to prison uh, for the maximum time possible. So there was, there was two reasons. Mainly I didn't want to go to prison. I knew if I took probation, I was going to violate. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. Um, I didn't know how to stop. So I knew you just throw me back out on the street. It's over. Yeah. So, um, and so I took this Ties Corp program and I'd sit in the workhouse. I think it was for like 80 days or something like that. It was like three months or something like that. And they, uh, another condition of Ties was that you had to do house arrest for, uh, for 60 days. So I got out on house arrest and I'll tell you, I made it three days before I would use again. And when I used, I overdosed because I had been clean for, for a couple of months. And I remember waking up in the ambulance and I looked down at my ankle and this was my first thought. It wasn't, my first thought wasn't, I almost died. Oh my God, what am I going to say to my parents? Oh my God. You know, I looked at my ankle and said, damn it, I'm off my monitor <laughs> because I was on house arrest and I was in an ambulance driving down the street. So I knew what that meant. I knew that meant, well, I'm going back to jail. And so Monday I just went down and turned myself in, which again, it's important to note that that was a step in the right direction. Instead of running, I showed up, I faced my consequences, and back to jail I went. Um, I remember walking by my old tank that I was in for that three months, and they saw me walk by, and a lot of the same guys were still in there, and they were like, how are you back this quick? <laughs> it's been like four days. Um, and that was, that was interesting. And then, you know, I sat down there for two more weeks. They let me out on house arrest again. And I decided that begrudgingly, uh, I was going to do this ties court thing, but I was not going to be happy about it. <laughs> In fact, I was going to be pissed off about it the whole time. And I was going to fight tooth and nail. Uh, any chance I got, I was going to try and prove some kind of a point about how I, I could do this on my own. But in doing that, they told me to go to uh, 12 step meetings three times a week. I did. So I got some exposure to that. And believe it or not, I stayed sober for six months. Doing what they told me to do, I've managed to stay sober for six months. I wasn't even trying. I was just following their bare bone guidelines and instructions and I stayed sober. And so, you know, that's, that's, that says a lot. Mm -hmm. that, that tells you that there's a formula there and they know it works. And if you take that formula plus effort from the participant, 
you get results. Problem is, I didn't want to put in any effort. Right. Um, so after six months, I would uh, I would relapse. Ultimately, um, I know now why I relapsed. I relapsed because I wasn't taking the twelve step meetings seriously. I wasn't following suggestions from the people that I met in the twelve step meetings. I wasn't taking suggestions from Judge McIntosh or the Ties Court team other than the bare bone minimum requirements that I had to meet. And ultimately it led to a relapse. No surprise there. You know, I've been around long enough now to know that that is not shocking. Um, and, you know, at that point they determined that I needed a higher level of treatment. Uh, I gave them a couple dirty urines and they screened me for a place called uh, CBCF. Uh, it's a cognitive behavioral program. And um, I remember when the judge told me I was going to be screened, I was very upset about this because I, at the time I was a manager at a sub shop. And I remember going into court and being like, you don't know what you're doing. I'm a manager. I'm a manager at a sub shop. And I and and I've got this under control, and you're this is wrong. Like like I had any idea right. what was good for me. Right. Um, you know, I had just given them numerous dirty urines. It was clear as day that I wasn't trying. <laughs> um, right. Um, and so I, I went. I got assessed. A couple weeks later, I went to court, and they arrested me. And ultimately, I went to CBCF. Fortunately for me, in those couple of weeks between the assessment and when I got to CBCF, I got nervous because I didn't want to go back to jail again. And I got a sponsor uh, in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And basically he came to me, he said, Lewis, are you willing to go to any lengths to get sober? And I said, yes, I am. I don't want to go back to jail. Tell me what to do and I will do it. I don't care if I have to stand in that corner on my head for an hour straight. If you'll tell me that's going to keep me sober, sign me up right now. And I managed to say, so I stayed sober for two weeks before they arrested me. So I had two weeks sobriety when I went to CBCF and uh, I got there and um, I took it serious. I, I tried, I put in an effort. Um, and I really took the recovery portion of the program serious. So there would be volunteers that would come in and speak to us. There was an AA meeting every night. I'd go to that every single night religiously. Um, the parts of the actual programming that CBCF provides that I thought I could use, I took that with me. And, uh, by the time I got out of there, man, you know, I, I had strung six months together again and I had a job at Donato's pizza for $8 and 15 cents an hour. And I felt really good about that, you know, because I, I wasn't sure I was going to be able to ever hold down a job or get a job with the felonies. And, uh, they released me on house arrest again, because that's part of Ty's court. And, and I, I did everything. I worked an honest program, you know, the whole time I was there and, and it was the same with Ty's. I got out and I, I tried to go above and beyond and I took every single suggestion that was given to me and eventually my life would uh, evolve and change and you know next thing you know I've got a year sober and I've got a new job and I've got my own place and I've got a car and all these things that I didn't think when you when you lay in a jail cell and tell me if this is something you can relate to sure you lay in a jail cell you, I found myself wanting the most normal, ordinary things. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, if I could have a job, a car and an apartment, I would be just over the hill, just over the moon, just, you know, elated to have those things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I can relate to that completely because you realize like those simple things that you took for granted are really valuable at that time. Well, it's like that old expression, you don't know what you have until you lose it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, man, how good would a hot bath be right now? How cool would it be to have my own remote control and my, you know, to control over the TV or just the ability to get up and go for a walk, right? Yeah. Yeah, I can relate to that completely, Lewis, because, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's just like, 
those things that you didn't realize were so valuable they are now that that they're gone yeah and and you know growing up for me i had this like because of where i grew up there was always this like this expectation of what lewis was capable of and what lewis was supposed to do and somehow at some point you know in high school i was like man i'm gonna graduate college and i'm gonna get a six-figure job and i'm gonna and like it was it was totally unrealistic and then you fast forward and I'm in a jail cell. It's like, God, I hope McDonald's will hire me, man. <laughs> you know? <laughs> You're right. Yeah, I hope that uh, McDonald's will let me flip a burger. You're right. That's so funny. It's like you have delusions of grandeur when you're a kid, but then when when all that's stripped away and you know, just the bare minimum compared to what you have would be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is funny. Um and yeah, man, like, you know, there's I have so many stories. Cause you know, I'm, I'm, I'm coming up on five years. Um, Congratulations. I, thank you. Thank you. And, and you know, I, the, the journey has been so fast and just so fulfilling, um, you know, but I worked really hard to get there. Um, and, and so, you know, initially when I got that job at Donato's, there would come a point where I wanted to apply to be a manager. I wanted to go for a promotion. And I remember talking, the district manager came in and I'm the type of guy that I'm, I'm outgoing, I'm a go-getter. So I'll, I'll do what I need to do to try and move forward. So he came in and I was like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to talk to him about this. Mm -hmm. And I went and talked to him. He was like, yeah, man, we'll get you set up with some training videos. And, uh, you know, I've heard you've been doing a really great job here this, that, and the other. And I was like, yeah, that's great. Uh, also, I'm a felon. And I remember his tone just did a full 180. He's like, oh, okay, well, we're going to have to, you know, get a little more time under your belt. And then we'll, and then we'll talk about that management thing. And I was like, dude, you just said like everything was fine. What, what's the big deal? Right. Um, and so ultimately I made the decision to leave Donato's and I, I'd go to a, a hotel and then one of my buddies in AA got me in as a bus boy at a really nice restaurant. And God, was that rough on my ego? Cause you know, you think of a bus boy and it's just like slopping dishes around and, Oh yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Um, didn't pay great, but I got my foot in the door. Um, all the meanwhile, you know, I'm doing what I need to do to, to stay sober. Uh, eventually I would, uh, I'd go back to CBCF and I'm going to tell you why I went back to CBCF. My initial reasoning for going back to CBCF, I walked in the front door that day and I went there just to kind of show staff, um, look at me, you know, I'm, I'm still sober. I made it and, and everyone was really happy. You know, I, I almost wanted to go in there and rub it in people's faces. And I don't know why I was that way at the time, right. but I was, mm -hmm. and you know, to my surprise, everyone was super happy and like, no one was mad. I don't know what I was expecting. Um, and then, and then I somehow someone brought up some volu like volunteer work and I filled out this volunteer paperwork and next thing you know, I'm going in there and, uh, I'm running the AA meetings every single Tuesday night. And I did that for like two and a half years. Uh, I would go back to CBCF every Tuesday night for two and a half years. And I would bring speakers in and I would interact with the guys and God, I dude, I loved doing that. I loved it so much. I wouldn't miss it for anything. My girlfriend was like, can't you skip? No, no, I can't. I have to do this. This, this is important to me. And it's, it was important for my sobriety and it was important to those guys. Um, you know, and, and so I, I started doing things like that. Uh, eventually I made my way to this restaurant in Arlington where I started out as a bus boy, um, and worked my way up to serving and waiting tables. And I, you know, I, I became really good at that. And, uh, and then eventually I'd get promoted to manager and that was right before, before COVID happened. Um, you know, and I just worked hard. I showed up one time, I worked hard. And, uh, and things started to happen for me. Um, when COVID hit and restaurants shut down, I, uh, I thought about CBCF and I had to stop doing my volunteer work there because of COVID. 
and I really missed it. And I said, you know, what if I, what if I applied for a job there? And it sounded crazy, but it made sense. Mm -hmm. Made a lot of sense. And, uh, brushed up a resume, you know, and, and put in an application, man. And I was fortunate that, that they gave me a shot. And so, you know, I, uh, I now work, uh, at the place I was once incarcerated. And, you know, I think that I bring something to those guys and that, you know, ultimately that's, that's the most important part of my job is how can I try and help someone today? And, uh, you know, I bring something to the table that, that isn't seen often. And, uh, I get to have conversations with those guys that I think are really valuable for them and for me. Um, and you know, my life today, dude, is just, it's outrageous. It really is. I, I live in Grandview again, which is that same nice neighborhood that I grew up in. Um, the same nice neighborhood that I eventually, you know, had to leave and was homeless. Uh, I moved back here beautiful girlfriend, beautiful family, you know, I have a job, um, and, and you know, in, in these times having a job is a big deal. Right. Um, and, and, you know, it, I don't know, I'm super grateful and blessed, man. Yeah. Not just, not just do you have a job, but you have a job that you feel like you're actually doing something with it. And, you know, you would, it, would it be fair to say that you feel like you're meant to do this job? Yes. Like maybe this yes. was your purpose all along. Everything has come full circle. Oh, you know, one of one of my uh, my sponsees, we were talking about higher power the other day, and I don't I don't um, overthink the whole higher power thing. And I told him, it's like, you know, man, my higher power should be on payroll for about seven figures a year because he has worked some absolute magic in my life to the point where even my job slash career, there's a purpose and there's fulfillment. And I wake up in the morning and I have found that the only way I'm going to have a bad day is if I don't get enough sleep. Um, I don't wake up and dread going to work. I don't. I, I love it, man. I love it. I really do. And I, I, And it's all those bad things that happen to me. And that experience that led me to this point. It's wild. I just have one question for you. What what's the what has this uh, transformation been like? Not just the transformation of you going into sobriety, but more so like, you know, here you were incarcerated in this place. You know, you know, at one point you're living in this in this dorm and you're listening to staff, and now all of a sudden you're the staff member and you're walking by that same room that you used to live in. And you know, what's that, what's that like? So God, initially it was very strange. Initially when I walked back into that hall, um, it was very surreal. In mm -hmm. fact, I had a lot of my coworkers come to me, come to me and be like, man, this has to be, so weird for you. And I was right. like, yeah, you know, it, it is. Um, I'm trying to think of how to answer this question because it, there's so much there. There's right. so much there. Yeah. I mean, it's there's things, for sure. there's things that I do at my job as a resident advisor at this facility, like, uh, pat downs right. or, or, you know, I had to handcuff a guy to transport him somewhere. And it's like, I'm putting the handcuffs on you. <laughs> right. And that is, that was strange. That one, that was the weirdest one. Hands down. When I, when I had to put handcuffs on a guy. Um, but ultimately, you know, I look at it as an opportunity to teach and not only to teach, but to, to set an example you know, and I use that, I, I'm with these guys for 12 hours a day. So that's a lot of time to, to have conversations or, and, and I'm very open about my past with them. And I do that for a reason. I do that to show them, you know, I was doing this and I do this now. And this, this, what I'm doing now is so much easier. You know, I'm not looking out my rear view mirror, worried about the cops pulling over. I keep my money in a bank account. I don't have to worry about the cops taking it. 
Um, I just, I try to show them there is an easier, softer way to live your life. There's a way out. And guess what? If you want out and you want to talk about it, I will sit here and talk to you all day about it. And I, I put that out there for them. Um, if you're serious about this, you know where to find me. Let's talk. Mm-hmm. I'd love to. Um, but it feels it feels right. It makes sense, man. Yeah, I could definitely relate to that. You said it's surreal. And I went back, you know, I was in Pickaway. And I went back there probably, I want to say about five years ago, and spoke to the inmates there. And when um, I got done speaking and we were in the back and they were having some cake and everything, and the the sergeant came in, one of the same sergeants that was in there when I was locked up. And he said, hey, uh, if you want to leave, you got to go now, because if you want to stay, you're going to have to get counted. And I was out of there. I was out of there, man. And I had to call my counselor back. I said, hey, I, I didn't mean to rush out of there without saying bye, but I had to leave, you know, because it was just I, I didn't want to stay for the head count. I think deep down, subconsciously, maybe I thought they weren't going to let me out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I've, I've shared that. The resonance, man, they will ask me, why would you come back here? Why would you ever... Why would you ever come back to this place? And I, it's simple because I get to walk out the front doors every night. No matter how bad of a day I have, if I'm walking out those front doors, it can't be that bad. Right. Absolutely. Well, hey, Lewis, it's really been great having you on, man. Um, we'll have to do this again. And um, I really appreciate it. Yeah, man, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. So this is how we end